the steep, the, the some of the words are real, so it burns off. Steeping dye is very important. The size of the cooking pot for cooking soups and curries, for steeping herbal medicine. Matter of fact, usually now to get this small size pot that you see on the left, you have to ask for a pot for a monum ya, monum ya, which means a, um, that's Thai for a pot to boil uh, medicine. Usually they don't use it anymore for cooking, they just use it to boil the medicine. Because the medicine tastes better if it could be cooked in an earthenware pot, boiled in an earthenware pot. Also, as you can see on the right, the same pot is used for collecting, uh, in a ritual purpose, for collecting the ashes of the deceased. And, and that's part of the study, the study that is getting more and more interesting. And finally, for there are actual specific ritual uses for earthenware pots. And certainly related to Theravada Buddhism. Our suspicion is that some of this is a holdover from uh, Theravada Buddhism, South Asia, South Asian background. And for royalty, because there were pots in the, for the use of royal people. Okay? Stoneware. The nature of stoneware. Very different kind of thing. Um, the domain of men in, in, in most areas. However, women do produce stoneware. And I will show you that using the fast wheel, as you see here. And it was really wonderful to see women producing stoneware, that they were the ones expected to produce the stoneware. It wasn't some aberration that we were looking at. And I'll show you some of the pictures of that. The properties of stoneware, hard, durable, non-porous, impervious to leakage from outside, moisture from the inside. Therefore, it's good to contain things. Okay? It's good for holding something. It's good for keeping something from coming into it, too, like insects and that sort of thing. Um, fire to a high temperature in a kiln, basically it turns the clay into a rock, and, and that's why we call it stoneware, um, okay, if it's, if it's fired correctly. This is a repertory of vessels for storage and transport of liquids that this man in Laos produced in 1991. Uh, the mouth can be sealed for secure storage. The flat base, which is the result of making on the, on the wheel, helps in stability. Sometimes there is simple application, combing or applique. Usually there is no glaze today. Uh, there can sometimes be an ash glaze as a result of just what happens in the kiln. But sometimes there are rare exceptions with this. And here's some examples. Jars for collecting and storing rainwater for household use. And the lineup of jars that you see on the right, or actually under the eave of the house that you see on the left here, uh, is, is, is one place that I found it. Usually now they have great big cement jars and, and gutters that they run the water into, collecting rainwater off the roof of the house for, for, for having clean drinking water. But that, that, that array of pots there, which are made in the next village over, uh, stoneware pots, um, was nice to see. For kitchen gardens and fields, in other words, you can take a pot out there and you can keep the water in it. The water won't leak away or leak away just fast enough to for the dust to wobble around in. Jars for multi-purpose household storage of grain, of textiles, of manuscripts, etc., etc. Uh, like you see here, this is rice that's been uh, husked. Pots for kitchen use, mortars, uh, mortars especially. Mortars, by that I mean these things that look like this. We call them croak. In Thai, we have a pestle, and you pound chili. Chilies and other things together to make it taste really good. Um, uh, for food preparation, bowls for soaking sticky rice, the jars with the holes in them that you see there and the small mouths with the caps on them are for uh, keeping small fish alive. When you catch a fish, you don't want to eat it that day, or catch a lot of fish, you don't want to eat them all that day, put them in one of these jars, they'll be alive the next day and the next day, and you'll keep eating the fish, so you don't have to go out and catch another one the next day. Bottles for storing and carrying distilled liquor, these have mostly disappeared, unfortunately, but uh, replaced by certain glass bottles. Okay, with Maymong or the or something like that. And jars for the fermentation of salted fish. Um, this is a delicacy uh, for those of us that come from Northeast Thailand, Laos, and further north. Uh, it's not definitely uh, a product of what's eaten or what's made in, 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 in Central Thailand or South Thailand. Uh, they use sea, sea fish. These are, these are freshwater fish. The, the point of this, of course, if you'll see the jar over here on the left, it's finished. You see how it has a double mouth? You can put a cap over that. You can put some water in there, and it seals it. So insects can't get in, but the ferment, the, the air 
the polluted air that you want to escape from it can escape from that pot, and it basically turns into an anaerobic environment. So if you leave the stuff in there long enough, a year or so, it's perfectly clean. It's already cleaned of every of every bad thing. Okay. If you use it too quickly, then it may not be clean of that. Um, so you have to be careful about who you buy your product from. Okay. We like that. Okay. Fed sometimes. There are also some special silver things. Bottles for serving drinking water to guests, especially if you have a, an important guest. You would have one of these bottles of Taunan to present the water to them. Sometimes it can be in earthenware. Bowls, well, mortars for grinding turmeric to beautify the skin. Uh, in, in Burma, you were used to seeing the women with the turmeric on their on their faces. I don't know that they have stoneware, what they use to grind that stoneware, but you can see on the upper left here that that's what they used to use in Northeast Thailand. Bowls for starching silk thread, the, the one on the right here, uh, has a hole down there at the bottom, and the silk yarn goes through there, so as you pull the yarn to, 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 to spin it, uh, you, you, get the, you get yeast on it from silk from the rice border, and that helps to keep the yarn, makes the yarn better. And of course, you have jars for fermentation of rice beer for hospitality and ritual. Notice that this is a glazed jar. It comes from, it, it could have been Chinese uh, 100 years ago. This was made, this, this these were probably made in, well, actually, this is more in the back row than where this pot was made, probably. And uh, uh, they, they, they end up in the highlands of mainland Southeast Asia, just as they do in Borneo and Sumatra and that area. And, and Pusaka, I can get the name for that. I got that. Um, and it makes wonderful beer. Wonderful beer. Okay. There are complementary roles in households. So there are uses for jars and uses for pots. There's a plastic basin there now, too. So that's its use. Now, formerly, that plastic basin would have been a, a stoneware uh, on, say, a thing like this. The, these these uh, jars and pots are fading. They're replaced by modern materials, by metal, by plastic by piped water, by electrification, which makes refrigeration possible, by gas stoves, by commercially processed foods. So you, you really sometimes sort of have to look for this. So there are two basic patterns for making stoneware. And uh, first I'm going to talk about um, um, stoneware. I guess it should be on this one. I'll just walk around a One kind of stoneware is here. We call it, Don Hine calls it inland stoneware production. And then over here we have coastal production. And he proposes, based upon kiln uh, structures, that they're two they basically different kinds of stoneware. And on the uh, um, um, Southeast Asian ceramic site of the Smithsonian Institution that we put up, uh, there's an article by Don Hine that explains these two different types of, of stoneware production based upon kilns. All the historic, historical stoneware production is known in Cambodia and Thailand. That production ceased at some point for reasons to be explained. And John's excellent work with the excellent Cambodian archaeologists have, have become in kiln excavation. The experts in kiln excavation will enable us to understand this better. However, in present day mainland Southeast Asia, stoneware production continues in northwest Vietnam, Laos, and northeast Thailand. Um, by this way, you notice that I've erased the country borders, even though I refer to them in the, in the thing here, because I want you to begin to not to see these countries. So we're going to get away from those now. And in Vietnam along the coast. These two regions constitute two distinct patterns, interior and coastal. We omit here, unfortunately, consideration of stoneware and porcelain workshops established by immigrant Chinese potters in many locales in Southeast Asia, including Singapore. Stoneware production also continues in several locations in Burma, especially in Bamo and Shan states, although we have not surveyed there. And that's we had a friend who was going in the so he did that. Anyway, this is a, the kiln slide over here on the wrong west, east, north, and south. <laughs> <laughs> Further away from here than here. <laughs> this is, this is, I call this the far west of uh, Singapore. I live in the far east. Uh, okay, the map. Northeast Thailand, now here, we're back to the same map. Unfortunately, I, I didn't have two maps talking about stoneware, but I'm going to talk about the stoneware of Northeast Thailand and adjacent lowland Laos comprise a single culture that is essentially Lao, 
Lao is one of the divisions within the larger Thai, T-A-I, linguistic family, which includes Lao, Thai Nam of Northwest Vietnam, or Thai Tao of Northwest Vietnam, the T-H-A-I of Thailand, the Shan of Shan states, the La Na Thai of North Thailand, etc., etc. We assume that the pattern of stoneware production found in Northeast Thailand and Laos there's a resembles that once practiced far more widely within the terrain of various groups of Thai speakers. So you'll notice here that we're already, I'm all, we're already hinting at a history. We're always saying here is that we believe this stoneware production that I'm going to expose you to now goes along with the Thai, it's TAI, the expansion into mainland Southeast Asia. Um, and there's, we have articles on this and we talk about it more uh, in other, other circumstances. So I just want to pose that to you. In Northeast Thailand and Laos, stoneware potters are men. They work in pairs, consisting of a shaper and a spinner. I'm just translating from the Thai there, uh, or from the Lao there. We work, they work on wooden wheels carved from solid logs that can revolve either slowly or swiftly as needed, lubricated by pig fat. The sharper turns, the shaper turns the wheel slowly with his right big toe. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> with all the photographs I have, not a single one of them show this thing, but I know what he does. Of course, you're not even wearing big, clumsy shoes when you're making this pot. But it's the right big toe that, he, that you use, the thumb, the foot, the toe, and it moves the pot this way, and you, you lay the, the, the coils on, as you see them on the left here. Okay? Then the spinner sits opposite him, as you see in the right hand picture, and turns the wheel fast while the shaper uses a pair of wooden ribs to consolidate the seams of the coils and to smooth the form, as you see here. Now notice the tools. Okay, notice what you, what, what, if you, if you were an archaeologist, what would you find? Well, first of all, you'd find nothing, because it's all wood, right? You might find a part of that log uh, sitting around, but you wouldn't find much else. Okay, and then look at the tools. It's a, one piece of thin wood, another piece of thin wood, and a wheel. Okay, and so what are you going to find here? How would you reconstruct a, 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 this site if you were even to think about it as an archaeologist? Predict what you'd find uh, 500 years from now. Okay. Um, the jars are made in two or three stages in a set of ten. Uh, so maybe you'd find ten depressions in a row or something like that, and that might give you a hint. But what you see here is the guy starts at the end we're at now. We're at now. And he works his way down this stream of ten pots, ten, ten stands, and then he comes back up and starts the next step, and works down and works down, and does that three passes. And in doing that, he makes ten pots a day, ten jars a day. You talk to a potter in the United States and say, you could make how many bar jars this size in how many days? Okay? One a day at most. Okay? We have, by the way, a new friend of ours came to this village in Northeast Thailand lived there for three months, learned more or less, more rather than less, how to make a pot this way. He goes back to the States. He has now produced 100 pots over the past summer. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that blows people's minds. Okay, well, yeah, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, he just showed it's a different technology, much more efficient technology making pots than, than what people use. So anyway, here's a set of pots lined up. And then, of course, you do have mortars that are stoneware that are made this way. Uh, and usually the, the, the potter's wife, uh, the, the mortar production that was more specialized in stoneware production, his wife helps him. Okay, this turn to Vietnam. Here are the string of sites in Vietnam that we have been visited, uh, where they made stoneware. Um, and we believe that this, this string of sites extending from Hanoi down to uh, near the Trong, I believe, um, represents the gradual expansion of stoneware technology associated with the Dai Viet Kingdom in the north as the kingdom expanded to the south over several, several centuries. What happened to stoneware production in Bien Hoa and the areas just north of the Nam, or north of, north of Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City? That's all Chinese production. And uh, we believe the Chinese came around and whoop, set, set up their stuff there, and that way sort of kept the Vietnamese st stoneware production from infiltrating for the south. Here we go, women. In this tradition, stoneware potters are usually women, and women potters make even very large jars, as you can see here. Here, too, there is a team of a shaper and an assistant who work together. The wheel is large in diameter, really large. As a matter of fact, it's a kick wheel, prime, basically. Set on a pivot with the working surface just above the floor level. The potter 
shapes the jar by piling up rings of clay on a flat, flat slab. The assistant sits close by, managing to keep the wheel spinning fast for the shaper using her right foot while she prepares more rings and slabs of clay. So you got, you know, this is embodied behavior. And how does that woman know how fast to spin the wheel? And she's over here making rolls of clay. Or, you know, and the perfect hands pull that leg is going like this, doing that, you know. And the other woman is doing like this, and, and they're, they're talking at the same time. Okay, so. But you were talking at the same time. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. It's, re it's really amazing. By the way, the flat pan pancakes of clay that you see here are the next bottom. So that's already done. So she, that's how many she'll make if she, if she works for really well. Now, as I say, these sites are up, up and down the coast of Vietnam, coastal Vietnam, very near the coast. And uh, they're really, really, it's really interesting and exciting to see them. Um, and this is all women's. And as a matter of fact, when they talk about decorating these pots, that's when the men get involved. The men do the decoration. And the men get all the credit. The women do the work. They say, but this is Mr. So-and-so's pottery because he does it.